Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight we begin our study of Daniel. And I have to say, I, I'm a little nervous about it. Um, there's not, there's a lot of things I, I love to talk about and I've talked many times about, like Job and the Psalms and, you know, just different parts of the Bible. Daniel is a little different. Uh, several reasons for that. Uh, one, one is there's some really hard text here to understand. And there's a lot of controversy about them. Whether it's the identification of the four kingdoms in chapter 2 and chapter 7, whether uh, what, what the 70 weeks are about in chapter 9, who are we talking about in chapter 11? <laughs> you know, so there's a lot of um, interesting questions that I don't know that I have answers to. Uh, I'm pretty sure I don't. Now, maybe by the end of the our study here, I'll have I'll feel a little better about that. But you know, right now there's some text that I'm not quite sure exactly what to do with. So we're going to walk through this together, and we're going to explore. We're going to think about options. Now, there's another side of Daniel, though, that is um, childhood Bible stories. That those of us who grew up in a kind of a church community, we know some of these Daniel stories. We know the story of um, Daniel in the lion's den or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Or maybe we even remember the, the statue with the head of gold and the four kingdoms. And I can remember a flannel board, you know, with the rock knocking down the statue. So these are those kind of flannel board stories that we heard about so often, as, at least as I was growing up in church. And so those are kind of really familiar but they're, they're sort of familiar to me more through the lens of a child than through the lens of reading the book critically. And I don't mean critically in the sense of criticizing, but I mean critically in the sense of paying close attention to how it's structured and how it's told and what the emphasis is and what the point is and you know, that that um, that can be a little different than what I remember as a child growing up. So it's uh, it's going to be on in one hand, there's some very familiar stories here. But on the other hand, there's some really difficult prophecies, visions that Christians and Jews alike argue over and there's no big consensus you know there's it's not like you can go oh well 90 percent of the people think this way <laughs> no you know it's like 20 over 20 percent over here and 15 percent over here and you know and, and then there's five percent over here i mean it's really a diverse understanding and we'll we'll get into some of it. that's why we're going to spend two weeks in chapter seven and two weeks in chapter nine because those are two very uh, controversial texts that have a lot to do with, you know, how you think about what's coming into the future. Or is it something that's already passed? You know, so the, the views on both ends of that stick, right? And everything in between. So there's nothing that's going to be um, about those visions uh, where we come down in terms of understanding them, there's not necessarily going to be absolute clarity about it. At least I don't have it at the moment. Maybe I'll get there, but right now, you know, I don't. It's one of the reasons I wanted to study it with you, is so I could walk through it again myself and pay more close attention and think about what's happening. So we have there is a handout, and uh, the handout will be on the blog as well. And so uh, it'll blog will be up tonight, and so you can those of you who are 
on Zoom right now can access it on the blog. JohnMarkHicks.com is where you can find it ultimately. But I want to pay attention to um, a couple of things as, that might help us. Tonight's kind of just getting a feel for Daniel. Um, and it, maybe the, one of the best ways to do that is to think about the structure of Daniel. And that's on the back of, of your handout. And there's two ways of thinking about what is Daniel doing? And how is it doing it? That is... What's going to be the point here? And it seems to me that we can we can come, we can kind of say the point of Daniel is on the one hand, how can you offer a faithful witness living in a hostile environment? How can you offer a faithful witness while you're living in a hostile environment? So Judah has gone into exile, right? This would be 605. There'll be three invasions of the Babylonians into Judah. We'll talk more about this next week. But basically, Daniel is in exile. He enters Babylon at the beginning of the exile, 605. Jerusalem is finally destroyed in 586. And that's the final deportation of additional ex exile, uh, exiled people. So Daniel is living in the exile in Babylon. And while you're living in exile, do you conform? Do you assimilate? Do you compromise? Do you, I mean, how do you live in a hostile, idolatrous environment? And we're going to talk more about that next week, especially Daniel 1. Because in Daniel 1, Daniel kind of, um, he accepts a position in the government. He accepts a Babylonian name. I mean, he, he does a lot of, okay, I'm, I'm here, you know. But then he has a, a line he draws. He says, no, I'm not going to do that. John? So how do we manage that? Yeah, Pat? Uh, do, would you mind uh, gi giving us the chronological years as you lay this out? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do more of that next week, but but there's also okay. a handout, which, which you don't have at the moment. I I'm but sorry. Yeah, you have uh, the first deportation to Babylonian exile in 605. Then you have the next deportation in 597, then you have the third deportation in 586. Um, that, that would be the beginning of the exile. And then the exile ends with Cyrus the Persian, Cyrus the Great, um, allowing Judeans to go back to Jerusalem in 536 BC. So those would be kind of the parameters here. And Daniel is Daniel's alive through all that. Daniel outlasts the Babylonians. You know, he, he lives through it all. all right. Yeah. You know, studying this this week, I, Daniel shows us really what's happening in this world today. Mm -hmm. You know, it's yeah. a powerful book. And I realize that, that, you know, stuff is happening in our world. There's kids being shot and all that. Mm -hmm. he, he reminds us throughout the book that God's still in control. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Appreciate that, Pete, because one of the significant theological motifs in the whole book is that God is the one who's acting and giving and managing, and God's in control. Despite the hostilities, despite the persecution, despite the exile, I mean, God's the one who's engaged, involved. God's not absent from this story. God is an active agent in the story. So it's not God has withdrawn from the world. But God is present and active in the world and sovereign over it. So that's one of the key points of Daniel. So how do you live in a hostile environment? One, you remember God's in control, right? And as Pete said, that, that's certainly applicable to what we sense today with the kind of the chaos and the wars and the worries and the anxieties and the infighting and 
all that's going on, we can kind of get uh, filled with a kind of anxiety that we don't know what to do. And, and we now we worry about everything and we worry about what's going to happen. And God is sovereign. We can allay some of those fears. And that's part of, part of why Daniel is a book. It's written to an audience that was um, suffering a similar situation that Daniel. So Daniel becomes, and his friends, becomes an example or a witness of how to live in that hostile culture. When you're living in a hostile environment, it's filled with chaos, it's filled with war, and it's filled with anxiety. What do you do with that? Well, I think that's the first six chapters of this book. The first six chapters really kind of address that. And I would call our attention to Daniel chapter 3 as an example here. You might remember this statement. It's one of the more famous statements in the book of Daniel. Daniel 3, beginning in verse 16. It's, it's right after Nebuchadnezzar says, what God's going to deliver you out of my hands? What God is that? You know, kind of an arrogant, you guys are going to die. You know, there's nothing that can stop that. And then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if he, but if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Our God is able, but if he doesn't, it doesn't change our commitment. And we don't need to make a defense. We don't need to kind of try to try to change your mind, King. We don't need to kind of say, okay, here's our God. Let me explain everything about our God. No, no. I'm, we don't need to do that. We don't need to be on the defensive here because we know who our God is. Our God can deliver if he wants. If he decides not to, that's okay too. It's that, how do you live in that kind of environment, right? You live with, with a confidence in God's sovereignty and you live with a commitment to do what is right no matter what lies in front of you. You do what is right. right? That's the first six chapters, basically. Now, the next, what, seven through 12, next six chapters, are all visions. So in 1 through 6, we have kind of, I'm going to call it narrative. And in 7 through 12, we have apocalyptic. Apocalyptic is just one of those uh, uh, technical terms or literature that describes visions, that details visions. It's a particular genre, just like um, a poem or a newspaper is a particular genre. You know, you don't write a newspaper the way you write a poem. You don't write a history the way you write um, a poem. Right? Different genres have different forms and functions. And apocalyptic is that genre of literature that describes the conflict between good and evil. And usually there's a persecuted people that is struggling to live in the midst of, that, of the evil that is persecuting them. And they're wondering where their God is and what God is going to do about it. And apocalyptic literature describes that conflict in symbolic terms in order to offer hope to the persecuted people. So the book of Revelation is the apocalypse, right? That word apocalypse means revelation. So this is the book of the apocalypse. 
and it's all kind of symbolic language to describe this conflict between good and evil and how a persecuted people are going to remain faithful and endure the suffering as they wait for the hope that uh, is coming. So the book of Revelation is an apocalypse. Daniel is kind of the major apocalypse of the Old Testament. Now, there are some apocalyptic sections like in Isaiah 24 to 27 and in Ezekiel. But Daniel has these six chapters of apocalyptic visions. And if the narrative is about being faithful, the apocalyptic visions are about hope, provide hope. That's not always going to be like this. These empires are not going to reign forever. These empires are not going to last forever. There's going to be one after another. They're going to beat up on each other. And ultimately, the kingdom of God is going to destroy them. Ultimately, the kingdom of God is going to win. That's kind of the, the, the vision we get from reading Daniel. And some, some divide the book up that way. And, um, and I think it's helpful to, to see it that way. And you can, on the handouts, um, you can see the, the chapters outlined there based on the history and prophecy. Some people call it, you know, we could just call apocalyptic of the prophecy section. But there's another way of thinking about it, and it's more complicated. And that's because the book of Daniel is rather unique in this regard. It has two languages, not one. You know, most of the Bible in what we call the Old Testament is in Hebrew, it's almost all in Hebrew. There are some sections in Ezra that are in Aramaic because they're quoting, um, like in chapters 4 to 6, and then there's a section in chapter 7, they're quoting uh, some documents, some official documents. So they're quoting it in Aramaic. And Aramaic, at the time of Daniel, at the time of, you know, for the, uh, during the Persian period, into the into near the time of Jesus, Aramaic was kind of an international language in the eastern part of the world, not in the western part, but in the eastern part of the world, until Greek became the international language. Aramaic was kind of the international diplomacy language, like French was in the 18th century, and English is now the diplomatic international language. So what's unique about Daniel is um, chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 2, verse 4a, the first part of verse 4, is in Hebrew. Then in chapter 2, verse 4b, it's in Aramaic. And it's in Aramaic to the end of chapter 7. And then you have Hebrew from chapter 8 to the end. So it goes Hebrew, Aramaic, Hebrew. And you can see that on your handout. Um, and one way of thinking about that is that, that the initial Hebrew is sort of introductory. We're, we're kind of introduced to the characters. Daniel in Babylon, right? And then we get the heart of the story in Aramaic. And then in 8 through 12, we get additional visions that kind of explore aspects of the story that was told in Aramaic. So the visions are about the heart of the story, but they are additional visions. So the question, you know, is, well, why, why is it in Aramaic? I mean, why, why isn't the whole thing in Hebrew? I mean, the Jewish book, right? Um, and that's a question people have debated. I don't know that there's any solid answer to that. Uh, all kinds of theories. You know, some theories are, well, maybe it was all in Aramaic and somebody translated the beginning and end into Hebrew. Uh, or maybe it was all 
Hebrew and somebody translated the middle part into Aramaic for some reason. We, we, don't, we don't know. Um, I would suppose, I would guess that more than likely that middle section deals primarily with uh, the interaction between Daniel and his friends with the empires. And it may have been intended not just for the reading by, um, by Jews, but it could have been intended to be read in a larger setting, maybe. Or it may have been that in, in the environment of Babylon or later when the book was uh, more available, Aramaic was the more dominant language. We don't know, really. I mean, bottom lines, we just don't know. But what it does do, what it does say to us, I think, is that there's a, um, the book is located, situated in the dynamics of imperial court and empires. That is, the court drama, these stories from chapters one to six, these stories, particularly two to two to six, are stories about the imperial court, leaders, emperors, right, the king, and uh, it's a court drama. What's going on in in the royal court, and maybe that's why it's in Aramaic, because that that would have been the language of the court. Um, could have been Akkadian as well, but Aramaic would have been more international. Uh, so maybe that's why it, it's in Aramaic. Well, we don't know. But what is interesting, it seems to me, is that when you recognize that you know one one to two a is Hebrew, and two b. That should be 2, 4, A, chapter 2, verse 4, A, chapter 2, 4, B, to 7, what's the last verse of 7, like 28, 28, um, and then you have um, 8 to 12, this is Hebrew, Hebrew, Aramaic, mm -hmm. what is really interesting is to see how Within that structure, within that language, there is a, a, a symmetry that goes from two, three, four, five, six, seven. Chapters two and chapter seven are parallel to each other. They're both about the four kingdoms. Mm -hmm. Chapter 3 and chapter 6 are kind of parallel with each other because they're both about persecuted believers. Right? You have the fiery furnace story in chapter 3. You have Daniel in the lion's den in chapter 6. So the perse, persecuted, the faithful witness, and then in chapters 4 and 5, you have two stories about two different kings. One king responds to Daniel's message and submits to the God of Israel. And the other king dismisses the God of Israel um, and suffers the consequences. So you have two kings. How are they going to respond to the God of Israel? God is sovereign. How will, the, how will the imperial kings, how will these kings respond to the God of Israel? No. One submits and the other rejects. So you have two different stories that reflect two different responses to the God of Israel. Hey, John? Yeah. Um, is it possible, John, that some ancient collector, redactor, uh, put together lots of different uh, and sometimes diverse pieces of Daniel and put them together that would explain the difference in languages and 
mm -hmm. and uh, parallel uh, 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 rendering at all? Yeah, that's that's certainly possible. Um, what we don't know um, is how that would have happened, or how it might have happened, or when it might have happened. So it really goes back to the question of when. There's two different questions. When did Daniel live? That's one question. When was the book of Daniel published? That's a different question, right? So the historical person, Daniel, who lived in Babylon, that question um, is about where was he located? What time would he live there? You know, who was reigning? And, you know, who did he interact? You know, who was the, who were the, what were the empires he dealt with, et cetera. I mean, that's a historical question about Daniel. Who was he? What did he do? You know. The book of Daniel is, is not necessarily written by Daniel. Now, we do have texts that talk about Daniel writing down some things and sealing up some things. So there are some things that the book claims Daniel wrote, but there's no claim that Daniel wrote the book. Right? Daniel wrote some things, but there's no claim he wrote the whole thing uh, or that he put it together. So it's quite possible that sometime after Daniel lived, some editor, as Pat's suggesting here, some editor put the whole thing together. It's like the Psalms. You know, the Psalms didn't all just come out at once. Right? Psalms were written over time, and then an editor collected them, right? So we could imagine something like that with Daniel, that these stories about Daniel whether it's the lion's den story or the furnace story or Nebuchadnezzar's insanity or uh, the dream of Nebuchadnezzar with the four kingdoms or the, uh, the boundary they drew in chapter one about what they're going to eat and or not eat. All those could have been stories that people knew, that people knew those stories. And then some editor, some person put them together, redacted it, um, Maybe it existed in Hebrew. Maybe some of those stories existed in Aramaic, and he put them together. That's that's possible. You know, we don't, we just don't know how that happened. Uh, but there is no claim that Daniel wrote the whole book. Doesn't say that. Uh, I think it's more likely that Daniel is this person who lived in in um, Babylon, had these visions, wrote some of them down. And then somewhere along the way, in a moment when Israel was again feeling the pressure of persecution, feeling the pressure of opposition, that somebody collected these together and put it out there as a, as a faithful witness and a hope so that they could read these stories and, and be encouraged in their situation. And that, that could be any number of situations. Um, it could be the community that came back from exile. You know, when they came back and rebuilt the temple and eventually rebuilt the walls, there was a lot of opposition to that. They were still living in, an, in a Persian empire. Right? There was still conflict. Still imperial rules and tributes and taxes and oppression. You know, Nehemiah tells us that people were having to sell their children in order to pay their taxes, that sort of thing. So Israel could have been in, living in an oppressed situation and then somebody collected this material and published it. Or, and what a lot of scholars suggest is that this happened in... Um, uh, in the 160s. And we'll talk more about this later. I'm, not wanting, I'm trying not to get too much into some of the technical details because we can talk about it later. A man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. Antioch, Antiochus Epiphanes was a Seleucid Greek ruler who did battle with the Ptolemies um, uh, in Egypt. 
and I'm not going to get into details at the moment, but he came through Judah and ransacked the temple, sacrificed a pig on the altar, put up a, a, a statue of Zeus in the temple. You know, I mean, desecrated the temple. Um, an abomination of desolation, right? So Antiochus was a, a ruler who oppressed the Jews. And some think that maybe Daniel was put together in that context. Now, I don't know that we can know for certain about any of that. Uh, all we can do, seems to me, or the best we can do, is read the text and learn from it. And that's going to be my focus. I'm not, I'm not focused on when do we date the book or when was it written or when was it published. And those are very controversial questions and they're legitimate questions. Um, but I don't want to take a lot of class time to talk about that. Yeah. So Daniel was an Israelite. Yes. Daniel was a Judean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the reason we're in exile is because Israelis had become unfaithful. Right. The Judeans, Judah was the only kingdom, you know, the only one left, right? The Israel, Israel had gone into exile by the Assyrians. That was back in 723, 722. And now Judah was the only one left in the south. And um they played politics with Egypt and uh, and Babylon, and, and eventually Babylon uh, invaded, destroyed Jerusalem in 586, and took the rest of the Judean exiles to Babylon. So, and that was God sending is Judah out of the land, right? Just like God sent Adam and Eve out of Eden. The saying, God promised that that's what he would do. You know, Leviticus 26, there's a promise, a long, long story there in Leviticus 26. And the promise is, hey, if you do what the Canaanites did, I'll kick you out too. You know, um, and that's kind of what happened. We'll, and we'll, in fact, we'll discuss some of that when we get to Daniel 9. What can you say more about Daniel's position or? In, in yeah, we, we don't know anything about who he was in Judah, who Daniel was in Judah. All we know, he's a young man, intelligent young man, good physical appearance, you know, um, and that's why he was one of those chosen by the royal officials to be trained in the wisdom of Babylon. So, apparently... Good looking, physical, healthy, uh, intelligent young man. And that's all we know. We don't know what he was doing in Judah. Huh? Probably, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe it might be that he was already in training in the royal court of, of Judah, that he was maybe like being an intern. You know, maybe he was a young intern in the, in the royal court of Judah. That's a guess. We don't don't know that, but that might be why he would have been identified uh, when they're because when you come into a, a when you come into a space like that and an empire wants to make sure you don't rise up again that you don't rebel again well we're going to take some of your best people with us that way you won't have the resources uh, you won't have the potential to rebel again. So I think that's probably why Daniel was probably one of those up and comers, internist kind of things. Maybe, maybe. No, there's no evidence. We don't have, as far as I remember, I don't, I don't, I don't remember anything like that. Uh, I don't remember what tribe he's, I don't think he's identified. His tribe is identified, um, except he lived in Judah, you know, so. Probably he was from Judah or maybe Benjamin or maybe he was one of the, maybe he was a descendant of someone who came from Israel, you know, the northern kingdom. So we, we just don't know. Pete? Yeah. Going back on what I said earlier, 
You're going back on it. You, you mean you're, you're giving up on it? Oh, <laughs> which chapter? Oh, chapter nine. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're not talking about love till chapter nine, then. Okay. Right. You know, what I said a while ago, it's very it, it led me to probably my favorite passage in the Bible. And I like to read it to you if you let me. What, in Daniel? <laughs> what, what, well, you're in the Old Testament, though, I can tell. Well, you got a big concordance in the back of your Bible, then, or something. Yeah, it's written all through my Bible. Oh, okay, got you. I write out my Bible just as biblical. Uh, I don't know. Some people don't think so. <laughs> now, go ahead. Go ahead, Pete. Uh, who, who should separate us from the love of Christ? Shall uh, trouble or hardship mm. or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? For your sake we face death all along, all day long. We are consumed as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in these things we are more than conscious to him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation would be able to separate us from the love of Christ. Yeah, Pete read uh, Romans 8, verse 34 to 39, something like that, 34, 38. Yeah, about nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. No tribulation, no suffering, no death, no pain, no trouble. Which I think, uh, you know, that's kind of part of what Daniel is talking about, right? And that in the midst of the persecution, God is still faithful. You stay faithful too, because God's faithful as well. Don't give up. Don't let go. So I think as we come kind of to the conclusion for tonight, uh, maybe this is a, a helpful way of thinking about this. Um, when you think about one through six, you're, you're talking about a historical narrative that situates the people of God in exile. And it's kind of at the end of the story of Israel in terms of what the Hebrew Bible tells us. Because the Hebrew Bible doesn't tell us much beyond the um, end of the exile and the post-exilic community in Zechariah, Malachi, and Haggai. So it's kind of at the end of the story as it's told in the Hebrew Bible. Israel's in, Judah's in exile. The whole nation's in exile. But Chapters 7 through 12 do something a little different. The visions of 7 through 12 continue the story. Now, Daniel is having these visions about what and to him was future. So he's living at the kind of the end of the story of Israel in terms of the exile, and he lives when the exile ends, that is, uh, well, when the Babylonians are destroyed, let me put it that way. And then he prays in chapter 9, hey, it's been 70 years, what's up? <laughs> right? Well, what, when, when's, when are you going to return your people to the land? I mean, the 70 years are over, so tell me what you're going to do. Uh, and he prays that prayer. So chapters 1 through 6, we're living in exile. In chapters 7 through 12, it's all about the future beyond the exile. What's going to happen to Israel over the next, depending on who you think he's talking about, over the next at least 400 years or maybe 500 years? And that's part of the discussion about, okay, who, who does he actually talk about in these? It's very clear he talks about Persia. And he talks about Greece. Does he talk about Rome as well? Now, those are that's one of the questions. Um, but the visions of seven through twelve 
that contain this hopeful expectation that God is going to do something to readjust the world and bring these empires to an end leads us to the coming of the Messiah. So chapters 7 through 12 are a look into the future, perhaps even up to the Messiah. Now, Jesus quotes Daniel in Matthew 24 and Mark 13. He calls him Daniel the prophet and talks about the abomination of desolation. We're going to get into that later on down the line. But Jesus recognizes something about the message of Daniel that is important for his own message. So the link between, uh, I'm trying to picture something here like Daniel is sort of like a hinge. There's a swinging hinge here. First six chapters, Daniel's in exile, living under the oppression, living under the, uh, the reign of these empires and not under, not in the land of Judah, right? With a temple. But then the hinge swings in chapter 7 to say, okay, let's think about what happens after exile. What's happen, what happens to Israel? What is the history of the world in relation to Israel and the coming of the hope of God and the coming of the fullness of the kingdom of God? And that's in chapters 7 through 12. So I think there's a well, way we could think about this is to say something like, Daniel functions like a bridge between the story of Israel in the Hebrew Bible, the story of its creation in the Exodus, its life in the land, and its exile from the land, and its return to the land. They return to the land, but then what? Well, Daniel 7 through 12 says, well, here's what. This is what. This is the rest of the story. And it's given to us in kind of future visions from Daniel's standpoint. It's a vision of the future. Now, the debate that a lot of Christians are having, and Jews have this debate too, you know, because Daniel has been a, a topic of discussion among Jewish believers as much as Christian believers. What Messiah is it talking about? Is it talking about Messiah? Who is it talking about? What history did it tell us? What, what has been fulfilled? What has not been fulfilled? What is still future and what is already past? I mean, all those questions about chapter 7 through 12 uh, get complicated and uh, a little frustrating and and um, some Christians get pretty adamant about it and get angry about it. And I hope that doesn't surprise you, but you know, I, I hope that doesn't disappoint you in Christians, you know. Um, but it does give us this sense of the bridge. Daniel is a book that bridges, when we put it kind of traditional terms, that bridges the Old Testament and the New Testament. It links them together. And when we look at the New Testament, the allusions and the echoes of Daniel are in a lot of places, particularly Revelation. Revelation has a lot of allusions to Daniel. A lot of the language of Daniel is in Revelation. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean they're talking about the same thing? Or does it mean that they're using the same symbols to talk about different things? I mean, that, that's a big debate. People argue about that. Um, but I think that's a helpful thing to remember. As we study the first six chapters, we're going to be located in Babylon, and we're going to be thinking about how do we live in a chaotic, violent, hostile world faithfully. When we look at chapters 7 through 12, we're going to be thinking about, okay, here is the rest of the story of Israel. How does this play out? Is it playing out today? 
Has it already played out? And we're done? Yeah, and people are going to line up on both sides of that one. Yeah. When you talk about vision, um, this last vision we had recorded is Revelation. Because Peter had a small vision. Yes. Mm. Mm -hmm. That when I think of a vision, I think of a dream. Yeah. But there's so many visions in the Old Testament that are really small. Yes. Well, in Daniel, we have some of those long visions. Yeah. The dream might yeah. That's a good question. Good question about, okay, what's the difference between a vision and dream? Right? And we're going to see dreams and visions in Daniel. So maybe we can think about that as we go along. I think they're kind of overlapping. You can have a vision that's not a dream. That is, you could be... Uh, taken up into a reality and have a and have a you know like it might be played out in front of you not a, not in a dream but like you're watching a movie screen or something you know like that or you could be asleep and dreaming and god come to you in some way to share with you a vision you know you know so it could be the same could be overlapping mm. yeah um, well, remember Acts chapter 2 said your your daughters and your sons, they will dream dreams and see visions. So this is not something I think we can say, oh, well, we're done with that. Uh, this is an ongoing way in which God still communicates. All right. But maybe I don't want to get too far into that one just yet. Um, but, you know. Because that, that that opens up a big can of worms there, doesn't it? Um, but I would I would suggest I would remind us that a lot of Muslim there have been a, quite a number of Muslim people who have come to faith by having visions of Jesus. That's how they came to faith. Jesus came to them in a vision, and they responded with faith. Uh, there's all kinds of stories about that. I mean, that's that's verifiable kind of, that's been recorded data. Um, so I wouldn't want to rule things like that out. You know. But the kind of visions we're talking about here in Daniel are more kind of these revelatory, prophetic-like visions. And But it's a good question about dreams and visions, and we'll need to think about that as we walk through because we'll have some dreams and we'll have some visions and we'll have some that are the overlapping. You know. God's sovereign through it all. But God is sovereign through it all. God is faithful, even in our hostile world. And God, God has plans. So there is hope. And God can accomplish what God intends to do. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.